Let's pray together to this morning. Father, we thank You so much for the privilege to come into Your house to worship. We thank You, Lord, that You still speak to our hearts today. Lord, that You're speaking into the lives of men and women. Lord, that if we will have a listening ear, Father, that the Holy Spirit is still teaching us and guiding us, Lord, and revealing truth to us. And so, Father, I pray now as we enter into Your Word that You give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are open and receptive to what You'd say to us. Lord, I yield myself to You to declare forth Your goodness and Your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm really encouraged because we've gotten to speak on the subject of love for so many weeks and you just kept coming back. But today, I thought we would talk about the commandment of love. Anybody who's ever uh, been in the military or perhaps just been married, knows what a commandment is. A commandment is a directive. It's an order. Isn't that right? This week I heard a funny story about a a couple of soldiers. They had a new base commander. And their base commander saw them guarding a bench on the base. He was doing a tour around the base. And he thought, well, that's kind of weird. It must be a really special bench. You know, maybe somebody really special sat there or something like that. And so he asked him, he said, guy, he said uh, you know, whether they, the sergeant, he said to the, the guy who was uh, leading, there was a sergeant, maybe a corporal or something there, he said, I asked, he said, why are you guarding this bench? And he said, sir, he said, we're guarding this bench. He said, because the former base commander told us to guard this bench. And so he said, well, that, you know, that seems kind of weird, but okay. He said, All right, he said, thank you very much. And he went to call the former base commander. He called him and he said, I was just curious. He said, I was touring the base. I'm the new base commander here. And I just saw two guys guarding a bench. And I wanted to see what was so special about the bench. They said they were guarding it because you told them to guard it. And he said, yeah. He said, when I got there, there were two men guarding the bench. And he said, I asked them why they were guarding the bench. And they said, because the base commander told us to guard the bench. He said, so I kept making sure that I had somebody there to guard the bench. So that guy said, the commander says, that's just too weird. i got to figure out what is so special about this bench. Who sat here that were guarding this bench? And so he called commander after commander that he could find. He finally found a commander that had been there uh, a number of years before that who was 95 and he was living in a retirement community in Florida. And he called him and he said... My name is, and he gave me his name, he said, I'm the commander at this base, and he said, I understand that you used to be there, and I've been trying to track down why these soldiers are guarding this bench. What's so special about this bench? He said, when I got here, they were guarding it, they said they've been doing it for a long time, and the commander paused for just a second, and he said, I can't believe it. He said, you mean to tell me that paint's still not dry? Just because there's a commandment, we need to understand why the directive. Why are we being told to do that? Why is it that God would tell us to love others? Why would He give us that command? It's because of the value that's in it. Today I want to look at some Scripture with you. We're going to go to Matthew, uh, the 22nd chapter, and also Mark 12, which is a parallel to that. What I want you to do this morning before we go into our Scripture, I want you to just take just a moment and think about, and this will be easy for you, I promise you. Think about someone who hurt you. Somebody who hurt you, and immediately when I said that, you recalled the hurt. It's easy, isn't it? It comes right to the top. Now you might even have, you might have said, I got a list here. But immediately when I said, tell me who hurt you, You know. Naturally, human nature, there's something about fallen man who wants to put me first and others second or third or fourth. But me first, definitely. And we're set up in such a way in this natural world that we understand when we get hurt, we recognize it, we mark it down, and many times it governs our relationships beyond that hurt. Meaning if you've ever been married previously, 
or if you uh, worked at a place where someone hurt you, or any of the, you know, fill in the blank with whatever your situation is, you experience a hurt, someone did something wrong to you, and you hold on to it, and immediately in another situation that may be similar, you carry that into that situation, and you respond according to whatever it was that you've experienced in the past. We all do it. It's just natural. It's our human nature. But thank God, we don't just have to follow our human nature. Amen. Thank you for that. I said we don't just have to follow our human nature. We don't have to do what everybody else does in this world. We're called to be set apart. We're called to be different. We can live our lives in such a way that when we get hurt, we don't act like the world acts. Isn't that true? Amen. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 36, says this. Jesus was asked, it says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Then in Mark 12, beginning with verse 28, it says this, in the parallel passage, it says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, he said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. And so the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but He, and to love Him with all thy heart, with all thy understanding, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that He answered wisely, He said to him, You're not far from the kingdom of God. He said, Jesus said, that all of the law and the prophets hung on these commandments. All of the law and all of the prophets hangs on these two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything hinges on loving God and loving our neighbor as ourself. But what does that look like? You know, in reality, if I was to tell you today, thou shalt not steal, we could all say amen to that, right? Thou shalt not kill, amen? Thou shalt not bear false witness, amen? Thou shalt have no other gods before our God. Amen? Amen. Thou shalt not... You can fill in the blank with anything that you want. You could go through all of the Levitical law. You could go through the, the Ten Commandments. And I could list them. And you could say, Amen, because they're all thoroughly scriptural. But Jesus said, All the law and the prophets hangs on this. Meaning what then? If I decided that I was going to walk in love... I'll never break commandments that were given to curb sin. Isn't that right? I mean, I'll never murder anybody if I'm walking in love towards them. Amen? I won't ever steal your stuff if I'm walking in love towards you. Isn't that right? And see, the the thing about the, the, the laws that were given by God to curb sin was those people could not be born again. Jesus had not yet come. They could not receive Jesus. They did not have the love of God on the inside of them like you and I have on the inside of us. And so those commandments were given to curb sin to keep people from doing wrong things. But Jesus said a new command. He said in John 13, I give unto you that you love one another even as I have loved you. How do we love one another? even as Jesus loved us. I'm to love you like Jesus loved me. It's the thing that frankly has kept me from getting mad at lots of people over the years. I mean, I'm just being completely honest with you. The thing that keeps me from not being upset with people like I want to be upset with people is because I have to love you like Jesus loved you and like Jesus loves me. Man, sometimes that's tough. 
When people are, are eating your lunch and popping the bag in your face, you know, just kind of like they do something that's hard and mean and hurtful to you. And then before you're even over the hurt, something else hard and mean and hurtful happens to you. How many of you know if you do feel like hugging them, it's somewhere about right here? Isn't that right? You say, I could just squeeze your neck tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. But the way that Jesus loved us, the Bible says this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. When you were a rank, worthless sinner in the eyes of everyone, that's when Jesus died for you and I. And He tells us that we're... He said all the law, all the prophets, all hangs on this. Loving God and loving others. Loving God and loving others. Which really seems like mathematically a lot easier to just keep two commandments than it is to keep all the others. Amen? But somehow yet, we find it difficult to love one another in that way. But evidently, according to these passages of Scripture, there's something extremely valuable about love. How often the Bible talks to us about the importance of loving others. Jesus said it's a command, and He said it's the greatest command. The Apostle Paul said in in 1 Corinthians 14, he said to make love our great aim. Our, Our goal should be to love others like Jesus loved us. To take a moment and to pause when somebody hurts us and say, no, you know what? I could hurt you back. You know, that's an empowering feeling sometimes, isn't it? When somebody hurts you and they don't know that you could hurt them too. It it, it feels good to our flesh to know that we can... uh, I heard the old church crowd used to call that that get-back spirit. (laughs) You got that get back spirit where you, uh, where you know that if I wanted to, I got you. I got you over. Oh, you got me. You think you got me, but I got you. I, like the guy that was, uh, he cut some dude off in traffic because he was running late because he was going to an interview and he cut some dude off in traffic, felt like he was going too slow. And when he went past him, he shook his fist at him and yelled, like, What's wrong with you, you idiot? He pulls into the parking lot. He goes in. He says, I'm here for an interview. And he don't know that he just passed the very dude that he's about to interview with. And he sits down across the desk from him, smiles real big, and he says, tell me what your best attribute is. Well, I'm patient. (laughs) It's never happened to any of y'all, I know. But in the world and even in the church today, there are different thoughts about what real love is. We have this idea, we think that love is a strong feeling or affection towards someone. And we call that love. But that's not Bible love. And that's what I want to show us today. I want us to see this together. Jesus said about real love, He said, A new command I give you that you love one another just as I loved you. Everybody say, just as I Just as I love you, that you love one another. The model for love, Christian love, Bible love, is how Jesus loved me. And anything less than that is not doing the best that we can do or that we're capable of. You know, God would not fill our containers. The Bible says that that in Romans 5.5 that hope makes not ashamed. The love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. We are a vessel for the love of God. You have the love of God on the inside of you if you're born again. Slosh that around just a little bit today. You have the love of God in here. God would not put that in us if He didn't expect that we would use it to benefit others. Isn't that right? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I find a good restaurant, I'm, a, I'm real quick to share that with you. You know, not, I'm more quick to share a good restaurant with you than I am a good fishing hole. I'm just going to be completely truthful. <laughs> I may not tell you about those places. But if I find something good or that brings value to me, oftentimes we tell people that we care about, about those things. Isn't that right? Why then would we carry around within us the most valuable, precious thing that we could have? God's very love. The love that He gave to us. 
and not share that with other people? Why would we withhold that for, for one second from anyone? I mean, other people, not y'all. I know you wouldn't. Jesus didn't tell the disciples to go and live according to the, the Mosaic commandments. He gave them a new commandment. He said, you know, in other words, in this period of grace we live in, He said, you are to love like I love. You're to love others like I love others. Christians misunderstand love and they think that avoiding ill words or actions proves that they're walking in love. Which in reality is just holding your tongue. And it's a lot easier to hold your tongue when something's going on than it is when you get in your car and you're driving down the road with your spouse. Isn't that right? You know, like something happens to you and I mean... Uh, I had a, uh, an instructor one time that told me we, uh, in a Bible course that I was taking. He said, anytime that you want to flesh out on people and blow up and you don't do it, he said, reward yourself by going down the road and buying yourself a strawberry milkshake or something. He said, celebrate because you did something good. But a lot of times, somebody will do something to us and then we get in the car and we're with our spouse and we say, that dipstick. And we start talking through our teeth. I shoulda, I woulda. Is that love? It's not. And, and it's detrimental to us. I mean, thank God we didn't knock somebody out at the grocery store. You know, kept us out of jail. You can laugh there because, you know, you've wanted to. You've wanted to. I know it. And the thing about it is I was behind you at Walmart and I saw it. So I know. <laughs> I mean, there's something to celebrate about the fact that you wanted to do something where you fleshed out and you chose to not do it. But even greater still is to take that further and when you get away from that situation, you don't allow it to, you don't dwell on it. You don't talk about it. You don't grumble and complain about it. Because what it's doing is it's causing you emotionally to become stirred up in that situation and maybe you treated them well that time, but man, don't let me catch them again because I've got myself all fired up. Isn't that right? Then you see him somewhere and you're like, there's that dude that did, you know, fill in the blank. And I'm only telling you this because other people have told me it happens to them, not that it ever happens in my life. <laughs> as long as we got a flesh to contend with, we're going to have those problems that we have to overcome. Jesus had more in mind than just curb, curbing sin in our lives. There's a higher calling. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia defines real love as this. It's an earnest and anxious desire for and an active and generous interest in the well-being of the one that's loved. Bible love, Christian scholars recognize Bible love as an earnest and anxious desire for and an active and generous interest in the well-being of the one that's loved. So, you know, in layman's terms, you could say real, do, real love does what is the most beneficial or needed at the moment for that person's well-being. It's about extending love or kindness towards another person. Jay, can you give me a hand for just a second? I want to give an example. And you're a, good, you're a great guy to do it because I know you'll help me out. You mind? Real Bible love is extending myself on your behalf. And I want to show you something. Jay and I, man, I've known Jay since Moby Dick was a minnow. I mean, Dead Sea was just getting sick when I, when I met Jay. I love Jay, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Okay. I'm going to, uh, we're right here, we're close, I feel like we're close to you. I'm going to ask you to say some not nice things about me. They can be true or they can be made up. Okay? Yeah? But as far as you're concerned, they're all made up. Okay? I mean, the only things that are off limits are my big ears, my weight, my hairline. No, I'm just kidding. Nothing is off limits. But every time I say something to you, I want you to respond with something negative. And when you respond, I want you to take a step backwards. Can you do that? Away from me. All right? Jay... I love you, man. I see the love of God in you, in everything that, that you do. When we interact, I see how you've been raised in church and the Lord has, has just really blessed your family 
And I see the change in your heart because of Jesus in you, man, and it's a blessing to me. You drink too much London Fox. <laughs> London Fog is my favorite tea drink. And he said I drink too many. Okay. Jay, your sister is a wonderful person. But honestly, I think she pales in comparison to you because you're the whole package, bruh. You like a lot, too. <laughs> Jay, if I only had a couple of hours that I could use in a week to hang out with another believer, and I'm looking at the short list of who can I hang out with that will help to, uh, to lift me up and I can lift them up, you're on my short list, buddy. <laughs> Can't even say anything nice about me, so take a step back. <laughs> Now see, I kept myself planted in this place and was talking positively about Jay. And I asked him to step away every time he said something negative. But in reality, every time I said something positive, when Jay is taking a step back away from me, I'm saying, you know what? I love you, buddy. And I'm here for you. And he's going to say something negative about me again and I'm going to say, you know what? You and your family have been a blessing to me. And I'm going to keep extending myself towards you. But what if you said something ugly about me and I said something ugly about you? And I said something else ugly about you. Something else ugly about you. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. The love of God does what's the most beneficial for the other person at the time. It's not about me. You know, I often think, like when people, you ever heard somebody say, I'm going to get mine? You ever heard that phrase? Oftentimes that means I'm going to get what I need, even if it's at your expense. And if you're always trying to get yours in life, and I'm always trying to get mine in life, how many of you know there's never any consensus reached? We're always going further apart. But if you are always trying to get yours, and I'm always trying to make sure that you get what you need, every step you take away from me, I'm right there. I'm moving towards you. And the moment that you decide that instead of getting your needs met, it's better to meet my needs, you're going to start taking steps towards me. And it's not too long that your step towards me and my step towards you puts us in unity. You know, with God, the Scripture says, draw near to Him, and He'll draw near to you. Isn't that right? The Bible says that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to who? The humble. Most of the division that comes to people and where they refuse to walk in love, most of it comes because of pride. An unwillingness to say, you know what? I'm going to love you anyway. Now this isn't fun. You know, it's funny when I'm telling a joke. It's not fun to hear this. Thank God I can say it because I don't know your situations. Isn't that great? That's why you preach on love early. Because you don't know what everybody's gone through. But pride will keep me from moving and extending towards you. It's just my pride. Really. There's absolutely nothing in this world that I'm going to take with me but people. And I've said that to you before. When I go to heaven, the only thing that's going to get there of all that I do, I could be the most successful person ever. You and I could be both you know, competing in business. And you know what? When we leave here, you're just going to have a bigger pile of ash than me if all of your stuff is accumulated. The only place that we can lay up treasures is in heaven. Isn't that right? The only thing that we can take with us is people. Isn't that right? Why then would we ever consider that people aren't the most important thing in our lives? 
They're more important than maintaining our old schedules. They're more important than our own feelings. They're more important. The thing that will keep you married. You know, no shame if you've ever been married and you didn't get it right. Now's the time to get it right. Amen? You just make a decision that if I was married before and it didn't work out and uh, somebody didn't walk in love and we ended up drifting apart, but I'm never going to let that happen to me again. It'd take dynamite to blow me out of that manse. Long as Sarah's there. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere because I realize that, you know, it, 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 I wish I could say we never fought. And I wish I could tell you that it was never her fault, but it usually is. No, I mean, you know, <laughs> reverse that. I'm kidding. She knows. <laughs> Brother Chris always got my back. <laughs> Sometimes it's going to be your fault. Sometimes it's going to be theirs. But the quickest way for you to be divided, the quickest way to allow the enemy into your situation is for you to dig your heels in just because you're right and you're not going to extend love because, well, I was right, uh, they were wrong, and so What? Who, in crucifying Jesus, who was right and who was wrong? Yet on the cross, Jesus didn't say, Lord, would you strike these people down that were so ignorant that they would crucify your son and they would... He said, Father, forgive them. Man, I always, you know, people uh, are real quick to say, yeah, but that was Jesus. But I always go back to Stephen in the book of Acts. When he's being stoned to death, and he says, don't lay this to their charge. Just a man like you and me. Don't lay this to their charge. People are going to hurt you. You're probably going to leave it. You might have got offended this week. You might have got your feelings hurt. You might have had somebody do something horrible to you. The quickest way to repair that damage is for you and I to choose to walk in love. For us to say, you know what? It's not worth you and I being divided. I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to treat you well anyway. Man, I've always got more notes than I've got time in here. Y'all got just a few more minutes? Okay. Somebody said, oh, so I'm not even looking at the rest of y'all. <laughs> Too often people say, you know, because they think they're right. Well, I'm just, yeah, I'm like Jesus. I'm like temple cleansing Jesus. They want to be temple cleansing Jesus. But if you can't ever be foot washing Jesus, you won't ever be temple cleansing Jesus. If we won't be willing to wash the feet of our enemy, we're not going to be cleansing any temples. Why? Because we haven't even swept our own house clean. We haven't even gotten stuff straightened up in here. But it's a real easy fix. Now, I'm not judging any of y'all. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you've gone through. Thank God I don't because I might not preach what I had on my heart. <laughs> I don't know what everybody's got in their life, but I do know this. In this world, Jesus said you will have trouble. You're going to have trials. You're going to have temptations. You're going to have tests. You're going to have difficulties. People are not always going to see you for the lovely people that you are. And they're going to hurt you. And I'm sorry that you got hurt. I'm genuinely sorry that you got hurt. And if it was me, I've already told you, I'm sorry. But the love of God is the thing that will allow you to get over that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip some notes real quick because I know y'all got to go somewhere. Probably, everybody wants to get to Cracker Barrel. I get it. How do I love the unlovable? How do I love people that hurt me? When the Bible tells me in Matthew 5.44 that we're to love our enemies, we're to bless them that curse us, do good to them that hate us, pray for those that despitefully use us. You say, well, I didn't, I didn't yell at them when they treated me poorly. I didn't talk to them. I just ignored them so I was walking in love. That's not walking in love, that's avoidance. Isn't that right? And in that avoidance, what the enemy will do is he'll start whispering in your ear and he'll cause that thing to fester. I remember before getting the thorn, I like to turkey hunt. And I, one of the things I don't like about it is thorns start coming out about the same time, you know, you can go out there and you end up getting a thorn. I remember one time I got a thorn in my, in my finger and I didn't know that it was in there. I knew something was, but I thought it had come out. You know how you get something that's way down in there? And it wasn't too much time and that thing began to fester. You ever had that happen? 
and it causes pain and difficulty. I mean, so much, in fact, that at some point you get on there and you like push on it and it finally pops out of there. And it's when it pops out of there that you get some relief. Isn't that right? Walking in love isn't just avoiding people or avoiding the situation or ignoring it. Because what that does is you might not be able to see it, but it's just festering. It's just laying under the surface. It's just waiting for the next time when they hurt you. And it's just going to pile on. And it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse. You ever had an argument with somebody? Maybe it's a spouse. Where they just blew up. And you're like, all I did was say, where's the toothpaste? Well, it wasn't about the toothpaste. What it was about was last week and the harsh words they heard and the week before that, the unkind thing that was said and the week before that where you were supposed to go and do something and they don't ever, they don't ever allow those things to, to just let go of them or forgive them or move on past them and then all of a sudden they blow up and you're like, my goodness, what just happened? What's, what, what happened here? It wasn't about the toothpaste and where it was at. It's about all that other stuff. Isn't that right? We don't avoid those difficult situations. We do something to change the situation. We're not called to make enemies. We're called to make disciples. Isn't that right? I'm looking at my notes. I'm like, oh my goodness, I got like four pages of notes left. Maybe five. We can't do all that today. We can't. Y'all will leave here, it'll fester, you'll blow up. <laughs> what do I do in those situations when somebody, oftentimes, I will do something kind for that person. I'll be a blessing to that person. I made a statement about two weeks ago where I said, don't give till it hurts. I said, give till it feels good. There are people that, like if they're watching this on Facebook Live right now, they're just now going to realize that I was mad at them at some point because I lavished them with blessings until I felt good about our, our situation. I did nice things for them until I felt good about them. And then if they did something to me and they hurt me and I blessed them, I sent them a card, told them something positive about themselves, gave them a gift card. Now I'm not saying, you know, you don't give everything away. Certainly some people mess up. If you've got a gambling debt, I'm probably not giving you money, but I might give you a gift card to your favorite restaurant to show you that I love you and that I'm here for you. I'm not saying I'm going to enable you, but I'm going to walk in love towards you because I'm not going to allow what you did to come between me and my Lord. And if I allow it to come between me and you, I've allowed it to come between me and God. The Scripture tells us in Mark 11, verse 25, when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught. Isn't that right? When I go to God and I'm talking to Him, those things evidently that I have problems with with other people in this world evidently will hinder my prayer life. It's a lot harder to be mad at somebody when you pray for them. Somebody does you dirty, and man, you want to chew on them, and instead you say, Father, I just ask you to sh show them your love in a tangible way this week. Do something to bless them, and if I can be a part of that, Lord, I want to be a part of that. Pretty soon, you can't be upset with that person. You walk in love towards them. And when you do that, like when Jay and I, was, we were up here, and he doesn't know what good tea is, and I just, I take steps towards him, you can walk away from me, but I'm coming after you. I'm coming towards you. What you've got against me, I'm not going to allow it to bring a division between you and I. I'm coming for you. I'm going to allow God's love in me. Greater is He that is in who? Me? Than He that is in the world? Isn't that right? What is it that you faced? What is the hurt? What is the pain that is not overcomable? What is the thing that somebody did to you that is too hard for God? Careful now. There's nothing that's too hard for God and therefore, if I walk in love and allow God to dominate those situations in my life, there is nothing too hard for me. I am able. I said I'm able because He has made me able. Because He has made me able to do it. Not because I'm so special. I'm, I'm exactly like you. 
I've got the love of God on the inside of me because I'm born again. But I'm no better than you. I'm no worse. But I do have the ability to walk in love towards you. And don't test me on this this week. Don't try to do something mean to me. But I'll prove, I'll prove my love in a situation. There's nothing that I'll allow to come between me and my relationship with my Heavenly Father. And therefore, there's nothing that I can allow to come between you and I. Close with this. The Bible says this. It says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And I challenge you to say this. If we can't even love the brethren, how will we love the world? If we can't even walk in love towards one another, how can we love someone outside these walls? You're the beautiful people. You're the good people. You're the kind people. You're the cleaned up people. You're the people with the Spirit of God on the inside of you. You're the people with the love of God in you. That's you. And if I can't love you, forget about it. I'm going to go love somebody at Walmart, don't even know Jesus, forget about it. If I can't love you, I'll never love them. And the reason that God said that love was so important, the reason that Jesus told us it's a new commandment, the reason that it's so valuable is because it's the love of God that will draw men. The Scripture says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's that love of God that we have on the inside of us that will change lives. Not our anger. Everybody can get mad. But not everybody can love unconditionally. But you and I can. Some of you looking at me like, man, I'm glad we only got one more week of this. <laughs> As we sing our closing hymn today, here's what I want to ask you to do. Remember when I said earlier, I said, who is that person that hurt you? And I said, I know immediately a name will come up. As we're singing our closing hymn today, I want you to take some time and pray for that person. Right there where you're at, I want you to bring their name before the Lord and pray for them. Ask God to help you love them like He loves them. Ask God to let you see them through His eyes. I promise you it will change your life.